if we understand the culture, if you understand the people that Jesus was speaking this to, when, when, the, when the older brother refused to enter the party, that was unthinkable in a Middle Eastern village. You see, we live in a very independent community. Everybody does their thing. Some people go here for shopping. Some other people go here for shopping. You do whatever you want. Well, with the, the, the Middle Eastern world of 2,000 years ago, there was no independence. And, and the, the younger brother had violated every taboo of the community when he left father's house to go to a far country and spend the inheritance. Well, that, that was a violation of their culture. He had publicly shamed his father. He had shamed the village. But now the older brother was doing it, but even worse. You see, according to the custom, when there was a banquet in a village, everybody came in. All the men of the community would go in and greet whoever the guests were. That was the tradition. And you can see that. I've been in enough homes in the Middle East and, and, in, and in Central Asia that there are many areas where that's still the custom. If, you, if I come there as a guest, then, then suddenly there's a room full of men who all want to shake hands, and we all meet, and then they kind of leave. They can stay if they want to, but at least they should come and greet the visitor and greet the guest. So that's the custom. And then the custom was that the older brother, the oldest in the family, whoever the father was that threw the party, the oldest would become the supervisor. He, he, would, he would be like the MC. He would be the host. He would make sure that, that the food is good and the wine is good and everybody is comfortable and you know, there's enough light and fire. And so he, he was the one who by the custom would be the one who would, he would greet, he would serve, he would supervise. So when he stands outside the banquet, haughty and mighty, chin sticking out, can you see him? And says, I'm not going to go in there. What's he doing? He is publicly shaming his father. And he's doing it in front of everybody. I mean, we all know that the younger brother had shamed the father, but I mean, nobody had seen him do it. He, he just done all his stuff was done in a far off country and people had heard by hearsay, oh, he did this and he did that and he did the other thing and, and now he's come back and you know, who knows, maybe half of it is true, maybe all of it is true, but he, he did shame father. But now this shaming is taking place in front of the whole village. He says, I'm not going to enter in. I'm not going to participate. You know, I, I don't know if your music stopped because this was unthinkable. The village was in shock. It, but the, what, what's the older brother doing? He's, he, he's acting so shameful. In the, and of course, the village waits for the punishment. How is the father going to punish this older brother? See, we maybe missed that. If you didn't get the backstory, you missed that part of it. But they all knew that. They saw, they, they say, we, the, he's, Jesus is saying to the scribes and Pharisees, what you're doing, you are defying your heavenly father by sitting there, judgmental, condemning of the joy that's going on as Jesus Christ is the friend of sinners, your judgment, your condescension, you are shaming, you're defying the one that you claim to worship. Do you see, why this, why this rage? Why is religion so angry? Have you ever wondered about that? Don't look at me so strange right now. You know, religious people tend to be angry. They're angry with the world. They're angry with society. They're angry with Queens Park. They're angry with Ottawa. They, are, they forever want us to pass petitions through the church every Sunday. We are signing, protesting against something. We are always upset about something. Yeah. And when our country go to war, when you do a study in our country, how many are for our country being at war? Well, among born-again believers, we are more for the war than anybody else. Don't look at me so strange. You know it's true. How did it become, become so violent? You know, in the, in the U.S. when they studied who was, who was pro the Iraq war, well, the country was kind of against it. But among born-again Christians, we were for it. Because we just want to go to fight. Find somebody to punch in the face. What is it about religion that makes us so mad? I mean, what's the big deal? Why is he so mad at his brother? 
Is it that, that, that if we are religious and we feel we are, that then we feel we are justified to condemn everybody else and we have to be mad at every group in society that doesn't agree with us? I don't know why you're so quiet this morning. How many are enjoying my sermon? Should I just go home and, 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 and should we sing a lullaby? Or what should we do? Are, are you here? What makes us so mad? Why, why, are we, why, why is he so angry? Because he lived in an illusion. You see, he, he had an illusionary understanding of life. He saw his relationship with his father as a contract. That's the word I've been using in this teaching. He didn't really see his father as a father. He saw him more as a master or a boss. He was out in the field working for daddy to make daddy happy. And if he could just make daddy happy with his performance, then daddy would praise him. Then daddy would love him. And then daddy would reward him. And that is exactly how many people view our heavenly father. If I just serve him enough, he will praise me. And if I serve God a little better, then he will love me. And if I could just do a little bit more for God, he will reward me. My friend, that is a twisted view of God. God doesn't love us because of anything we do. He loves us because he is love and we are his beloved. 